Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. As you undoubtedly know, law enforcement agencies around the country issued warnings this week about the potential for major anti-Semitic activity this weekend when neo-Nazis will participate in a so-called National Day of Hate. Yeah, you should exhale. The Events Planning Committee was made up of a small white supremacist group from Eastern Ohio, but thanks to the hate group channels on the internet, the effort has attracted interest from other white supremacist groups across this country, including the National Socialist Movement and the GDL, the Goyim Defense League. That's a real thing. Uh, this group most famous for including uh, the, the sort of dissemination of anti-Semitic flyers last weekend at the Daytona 500. They made the news, the GDL. Security organizations reported that the neo-Nazis plan to, and this is a quote, photograph or record direct actions and submit them online in order to create a compendium of exploits from around the country. Because the Jewish community is, quote, an enemy of the American people and part of the anti-white establishment, end quote. Other neo-Nazi chatter associated with this day of hate noted that Jews are satanic and called for white power to prevail against us. As an aside, I just want to say, like if you find yourself involved in a group that promotes this kind of language, or an event called the Day of Hate, you probably should consider that a red flag and maybe find a different community. It's astounding to me that this is a thing. But nevertheless, hearing about things like this are scary. Not just because it brings our history as victims of anti-Semitism throughout the generations to the surface, and that would be enough. But also, and I think more poignantly, because we all know too well it only takes one person to be captivated by such hateful ideology to spill blood. As I've shared before, on a reactive level, we all need to be vigilant when it comes to responding to this reality in which we now find ourselves. We at NSCI, like every other synagogue, take security seriously, and sadly but necessarily, it has become our highest priority. And you should know, folks, that kills me. Anyone who works at a synagogue, you should know what a Shonda that is. We all can and should remember that if we see something, we need to say something. We need to report anything that seems suspicious to the appropriate authorities. And that's Ashonda too. We've been counseled not to confront individuals who might be participating in seemingly nonviolent anti-Semitic activities because such individuals are likely willing to escalate the situation to violence for the purpose of filming it on their own digital propaganda channels. And that's disgusting. More importantly, though, I think, is the understanding that this is the world we live in now. And these hate-fueled souls who are seeking our destruction are not likely going anywhere, given the tenor of the times in which we live no less the universal access to the world's loudest and most personalized megaphone that is social media. This is a part of what it means to be a Jew or a person who loves someone Jewish today. Something that has been a truth and a trope, though, throughout our history. It isn't new. And make no mistake, then and now, the goal of any anti-Semitic effort has always been to stop the Jewish community from being Jewish, from showing our Judaism, 
The biggest win for the participants in this year's Day of Hate effort would be for fewer people to show up at Friday night services or Saturday morning services, for their efforts to disincentivize Jewish practice and expression. Erasure is the goal. And that's not just of the Jewish people, but it's of Jewish history, of Jewish ritual, of Jewish culture, and of Jewish practice. To me, it feels eerily timely that in just a little over a week, we'll observe Purim, the story commemorating the Jewish community's response to one of the first organized days of hate. In response to Haman's plan to wipe out the Jews in a single day, Esther, the heroine of the story, her initial reaction is to isolate and hide, to turn away from her connection to the Jewish community. And can you really blame her? I imagine many, if not most of us, can relate to Esther in this. I received so many calls this week from congregants sharing that they were scared to come to services tonight or tomorrow, or to come to synagogue at all. And I get that. There's a lot to be scared about. Last week, two Jewish people walked out of synagogue in Los Angeles and were shot. Didn't hear about that one? One of the main powers of fear is how it invites us to isolate and hide. And hate mongers know that. But as you know, that's not how the Purim story ends. After another exchange with Mordechai, Esther changes her mind. She ultimately discerns a plan of action that begins with her directing Mordechai to, this is the Hebrew, knos et kol hayehudim, gather together all the Jews. And note, Esther doesn't just gather the wise men or the pious. She gathers everyone, the entire community, all the Jews. Ultimately, the Purim story reminds us that a key way to ease our fears is to make the choice not to remain alone, not to isolate, and instead to come together. And we need to note that making such a choice, well, that's entirely in our control. Nobody gets to take that away. Then and now, when the forces of darkness seeking our diminishing, our erasure, come about, our strength can come from our unity, our being together, our showing up for ourselves, for each other, and for something larger than all of that and all of us at the very same time. If you think about it, Purim, in the story itself, but also in how we are taught to observe it, actually holds within it pretty solid advice for how to respond to anti-Semitism still today. If fear serves to keep us distanced from one another and thereby weakened, a redirecting toward one another and a higher purpose can serve to squelch despair and illuminate a path of hope and possibility instead. Remember, what are the three mitzvot associated with Purim? The first one, to celebrate it with joy and gladness. The second, to send treats to one another, mishloach manot. The third, to give tzedakah, gifts to the poor, matanot le'evyonim. Take all the Hebrew out of it. Think of that more simply. Even amidst a background of fear, to cultivate joy and gratitude collectively, to forge positive connections between one another, and to do something to help improve the lives of others beyond ourselves. And if that is a threat to the so-called white establishment, then thank God To be sure, there will always be some group whose charter indulges the very worst of humanity, requiring the elevation of oneself through the degradation of another. 
but that will always stand directly in the face of our own Jewish charter, which is one that elevates blessing over curse, life over death, light over darkness, through the regular practice of loving both our neighbors and the strangers as ourselves all toward a goal not of lifting ourselves supreme over anyone else, but rather of doing nothing less than repairing the world in its entirety. Full stop. Despite it all, I sure am glad to be a part of this group. I hope you are too. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>